Welcome to this meeting this week. And uh, before I formally introduce uh, Dr. Go uh, for today, uh, who is today's uh, feature speaker, uh, just quickly uh, have an intro uh, as usual. Our project has three initiatives, their diversity, awareness, and education, their diversity at work and wellness, and their diversity independent living skills initiative. And embedded in each initiative are several programs uh, that have been active for the last um, few years. And um, I'm not going to tell you too much about them today, but to uh, mention that our annual Stanford Neurodiversity Summit uh, is going to uh, be held in September and uh, that will be from September 20, her PhD in 2013 at uh, London's uh, UCL Wellcome Trust uh, Institute of Neurology under Brain Stimulation Lab. She began her fellowship at UC Berkeley Sleep and in Neuroimaging Lab. During her time in the Bay Area, she co-founded ARIA Brain Imaging an AI consciousness research platform with Dr. Ryota Panay. She continued to serve as a postdoc fellow in UCL's Applied Cognitive Neuroscience Lab before joining Cognitive Leap in 2017. Crystal also holds a uh, MA in Psychological Counseling from PAU and is a professional mindfulness teacher trainer with an international student base. Crystal specializes in designing, developing, and implementing mental health technology products for real world use. Welcome, Crystal. And I'll uh, end the sharing, and uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Fong. Um, we're so excited to be part of this conversation today. So really honored um, to be part of this. Let me just quickly share my screen. Can everyone see it? All right. So today we're going to be discussing, I'm going to be introducing something called the Hope Focus System. And uh, we call it HFS for short. And it's a revolutionary uh, intervention for ASD children. But I wanted to start off today's talk talking about neurodiversity and what our approach to neurodiversity is, what context we see it in. To give you a summary, um, I'm going to start off by talking about neurodiversity in underserved communities, which is what Cognitive Leap focuses on right now. And then I want to share a little bit about how we see neurodivergence and what it really means to me from a biological perspective. And then in the part three, we're gonna talk about how we actually utilize this knowledge of what neurodivergence is from a biological level into building um, HFS, our, our intervention, and why the therapeutic elements can be linked back to these neurodivergent correlates. And lastly, I'm gonna show everyone some pilot intervention data that's very, very positive. So, Cognitive Leap focuses on serving um, underserved communities. Something that we really focus on is accessibility, affordability, and making things available, making solutions available. Just to get a sense, how many people here work in the mental health industry? Is there, um, can you show, raise your hand or type one in the, in the webinar chat? And how many people here today um, are actually parents or guardians or take care of neurodiverse children? Right. And then overlapping, how many people here identify as a neurodiverse person? So I'm really proud to share that 
in Cognitive Leap, we're a small organization, but we really, really value the traits and we see um, a lot of people come to our, our company because they're very attracted to our philosophy and our attitude towards neurodiversity. In fact, I would say that so many people in our company um, have traits or they are parents with um, children who are neurodiverse. And so we have a community, you know, we have this atmosphere of real acceptance. And when we talk about human-centered AI, this is really how we create it. There's no, um, we can't compensate that. It really starts from within each individual and then within the company and our attitude towards neurodiversity. So let's look at some recent data um, of the Chinese-speaking diaspora in the USA. We see that there's a high inflection and increase in the proportion of Asian population in the US. And especially um, in Chinese immigrants in the Bay Area, we also see this inflection. Looking at the CDC data, we see that prevalence of autism among eight-year-old children in the U.S. has increased significantly, especially for Asian or Pacific Islander children. And this prevalence for underserved racial minority groups is 30% higher in 2020 compared to 2018. Interestingly, there is lacking research or data on autism prevalence in Chinese population in the U.S. So what we can only do is extrapolate from um, China's prevalence statistics and also extrapolating from the CDC um, statistics. But what this is also telling us is that there isn't a lot of interest, even though um, there is a growing number, growing incidence. So now compared to um, some statistics on language service statistics, that are provided by regional centers. And we're looking at California. In this example, we see San Gabriel Regional Center. The utilization for Mandarin Chinese and Cantonese Chinese is much, much, much lower than English and Spanish. And when we look at per capita expenditure um, for regional centers in terms of these languages, they also rank the lowest. So we see a real uh, contrast in terms of the population increase, but also the resources utilized and expended towards this. Something that we really aim to do is to target this accessibility. When we think about neurodiversity, we cannot really only look at it in a vacuum. Um, I would urge all of us to look at it in the context of other dimensions of intersectionality, other dimensions and identities of privilege and oppression. So here we see an axis of ableism and neurodiversity would probably fall under ableism um, and mental health, but every person also holds um, many other identities. So when we think about the experiences of neurodivergent individuals, they are shaped by also the intersection of their particular neurological differences together compounded with other social identities. So we call this compounded marginalization. I want to draw uh, a typical profile of one of our children who would come to one of our centers in say Irvine, Southern California. Maybe they are eight years old, parents um, are new immigrants to California. Oftentimes, maybe they are being taken care of only by one parent. Language barrier um, becomes a really big issue. Uh, cultural integration becomes a really big issue. Uh, racial uh, issues that they face. And in school and in the environment and in their community, every day they are dealing with these pressures. On top of that, if they are a neurodivergent individual, then this is completely compounded. Sometimes um, because of the cultural pressure or the stigma, they may not be diagnosed, they may not have sought um, intervention or treatment. Um, there may be a, a denial around that. And so sometimes children come to our um, centers really, really in despair, uh, compounded. Their, their emotional despair is compounded by these intersectional cultural and social emotional factors. When we look at um, neurodiversity, we are not only looking at the 
neurological challenges, not only at the neurodiversity challenges, but the way that they interact with the barriers to adequate care that are experienced by marginalized groups. So on the left, we see these common intervention challenges that whether they are from a marginalized group or not, people may, in the individuals who are moved at divergent may experience. And on the right, we see that particular to marginalized groups, they have even higher barriers to care. So when we combine these together, we're really looking at individuals who need a lot of understanding of their particular plights um, and what is happening in their ecosystem that exacerbates and exacerbates their uh, neurodivergent difficulties. And from there, we need to start having these conversations. That is how our approach to human-centered product building comes from. It comes from this larger background of understanding um, the different layers of social difficulties that each faces diversity is because their biological correlates are divergent, brain diversity. And so here I really want to say a little bit about um, the biological correlates of neurodivergence and why this is really important when we think about building novel solutions for autism and also for neurodivergent individuals. When we look at the etiology of NDDs, of course, there is a high comorbidity. On the left, just a very simple um, example of how behavioral phenotypes of ADHD and autism overlap. And also here we see that neurodiversity doesn't only mention or doesn't only include autism, but also a whole spectrum of neurodevelopmental disorders going to be autism, but their etiology has a lot of overlap. And when we talk about ASD etiology, there are many different levels of analysis and different levels of therapeutic target that we can uh, look at. So on the genetic and epigenetic, neurobiological, cellular, molecular, environmental, all of these do interact. They're interrelated. For us, we are focusing on the neurobiological level of um, neurodivergent etiology. So we're looking at what are the differences in structural, organizational, functional connectivity of the brain, neurotransmitter regulation differences. And by recognizing this particular level of ASD etiology, we are hoping and we are aiming in our invasively target these correlates. And so familiar levels of um, etiology, we know that affecting one level of change can lead to bottom-up changes in behavioral and cognitive phenotype. And a lot of the times, you know, when we have patients and clients, they come, um, that is mostly what they are really caring about. I'm sorry, I've just been told that my connection is unstable. Is this, is it okay now? Is this better? Okay, going in and out. I'm very, very sorry about that. Good now, okay. So when we talk about neurodiversity, we're not really only considering just the neurocorrelates of ASD. Um, we're also raising awareness. We're also educating and, and urging people to look at what neurodiversity actually means. It has a very physical and real uh, root to why we're saying ASD should be framed as neurodiversity instead. When we talk about cortical divergence in autism, um, one of the most studied and published areas is on motor control. 
I keep getting inactivating my video. Okay. Is this better? Yeah, th that's fine. Yeah, okay. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, so when we talk about motor control and functional specialization, um, what we see in neurodivergent individuals, especially with autism, is primary motor cortex, atypical functional organization. We also see body control, differentiation, asymmetry. So top, bottom, and left and right body control show different organization in the brain compared to typical development. Okay, and in terms of functional and sensory motor integration in the brain, we see altered prefrontal functional connectivity. So the way that the prefrontal cortex and the motor areas of the brain um, are connected, are functionally connected and talking to each other, that's also atypical in autism. How this shows up is difficulties in interoception, uh, which is like an internal physical body awareness, as well as balance and coordination issues. We also see a lot of studies where we see morphological differences in brain structure in the primary motor and somatosensory cortices and inferior parietal cortices, as well as the cerebellum. So gray matter volume and structural differences. Um, on the right here, we see uh, functional connectivity and differentiation of the, of the brain. This is a top view of the motor cortex, and this is a front view. And we see that in the dorsal lateral areas um, of the prefrontal cortex, we see differences between typical development and autism. So this is a, a recent paper from uh, molecular psychiatry looking at functional connectivity and widespread network in the brain comparing between uh, typical development and autism. And what we're seeing is very interesting inter and intra hemispheric network differences. In terms of intra hemisphere, so between um, hemispheres, we see differences in the way that the left and right hemispheres are talking to each other, particularly in the language network. But when we look at how the brain is talking to each other within each hemisphere, we see even more differences between um, autism uh, individuals and uh, typical development. And so language network and the somatomotor network, so the way uh, sensory processing and motor processing is, um, is dealt with, and sorry, I keep getting messages. And also the singular opercular uh, network, which is connecting the frontomotor sensory as well as the insula. And so this has a lot to do with interoception as well. Another area where cortical divergence in autism is seen is auditory processing, which then affects language processing. So we see that auditory sensitivity is altered. The way that uh, neurons are controlling their excitation and inhibition ratios, we say neural gain modulation, that is seen atypical in autism children. Um, we also see difficulty tracking auditory stimuli changes. So the loudness, the pitch, the yaw, all of these um, different modalities and dimensions of sound processing becomes um, challenged in the neurodiverse brain. And this is all, it, it comes down to the level of neurogain modulation. And so how this comes out in behavior is that there can be difficulty decoding language um, and processing environmental noise. So we're really seeing here that the behavioral phenotypes that we observe so commonly can be really traced down really to very um, specific alterations or divergences in the neurobiological level. There's also asymmetrical language processing. So weakened activation in the dominant auditory hemisphere during speech perception, as well as functional connectivity differences. So here we see um, looking at the primary auditory cortex and projections to the parietal speech processing is different um, for uh, neurodivergent individuals. And lastly, cortical divergence in autism points to sensory processing differences. So um, emotional and non-emotional non touch differentiation becomes difficult. 
Somatosensory regions are divergent in their activation patterns. We see in studies, hyper and hypoactivation to sensory stimuli and gating, again, when we talk about excitatory and inhibitory ratios. There are also widespread functional connectivity differences. So we're starting to really see a pattern in the cortical divergences um, in neurodivergent individuals. A lot of functional connectivity alterations compared to typical development. And we also see that many of these networks are interrelated and interprojecting. This is a simplified schema I like to use to um, present to parents of neurodivergent children because sometimes, a lot of the time, they are really focused on the top of this pyramid, um, especially the Chinese diaspora that we serve. Um, they see the top of this pyramid and under their understanding is that we really need to focus on that. But what I try to, uh, I, what I try to explain is that our brain is like a hierarchy of neural information integrating. The ways that the brain are divergent that I shared just now can be looked at as lower level information processing. But we know that affecting these so-called lower level inf information processing can create bottom-up effects, um, integrating and improving our higher level cognitive performances. And so this is actually a very simplified premise on which how we build the HFS intervention. Why did I spend so much time talking about brain differences? Because those are exactly the areas that we want to target. So let's move into the HFS core principles and the therapeutic elements. Really want to introduce the actual intervention to you now. In short, in summary, um, HFS stands for the HOPE Focus System. It's an AI-supported, uh, personalized, and drug-free intervention system. We support children age 5 to 18, and we address ADHD, uh, ASD, and related attention, sensory processing, and social-emotional challenges. We also integrate multiple strategies that are clinically proven, and we meet multifaceted needs of each neurodiverse child. Our main therapeutic elements include music listening therapy and skill-based exercise training, and we use that to combine um, with the strong emphasis on building connections and trust with the HFS coach. So the HFS coach is almost like the backbone of the um, intervention, and part of being human-centered is that we don't put the child to interface with technology. We put the child to interface with a human, human-to-human -human connection, and our AI assistance supports the coach in delivering the intervention. HFS supports strength-based development, and we have um, really great data that indicates improvements in cognitive motor language and social-emotional skills. So one of the core principles that HFS holds really, really strongly is connection and strength-based approach. Um, one of our partners, founding partners, Dr. Ned Hallowell, he is, those of us in um, the ADHD field would know him. He wrote Driven to Distraction. Um, he's had a teaching post in Harvard for a long time, New York Times bestseller. He was one of the earlier proponents of strength-based approach looking at neurodevelopmental disorders. And rather than using the medical model, rather than focusing on deficits, dysfunctions, impairments, um, he really posited to view children in a positive way and discovering strengths and reconnection. And he built this uh, framework called the five-step cycle of excellence, which is very, looks very simple, but actually extremely powerful the way that we've seen children uh, change from despair to hope when we really implement such a cycle. And so in the cycle of excellence, the first step is connection. We talked about the different uh, compounded marginalizations of neurodiverse individuals. Um, 
especially from marginalized or underserved communities. And when they come to our center, sometimes they feel really depressed, unaccepted, they're self-judging. And through connection with our HFS coaches, they actively cultivate connection. And then they start to feel connected and they start to feel secure. So one of the reasons why we have zero attrition rate in our intervention, we have uh, this really high adherence rate and nobody has dropped out of the intervention at all, is because we really build this therapeutic connection. And children, some of them for the first time in a long time, they start to to feel joy, they start to feel happy, they start to feel trust, and they really want to come back. Um, and they don't see it as an intervention, they see it as play, which brings us to our second point. In our second part of the cycle of excellence, we use the strength-based approach where we're not forcing them to do something that they don't want to do. And so we're finding ways in which they are able to participate and be engaged. This lowers children's resistance. We're not forcing anything. We're moving with their current, their flow. And this improves their learning efficiency. So it goes to the third point of our cycle of excellence, which is practice. And when we talk about AI um, assistance, the AI assistance helps to choose the most suitable uh, activity um, or kind of modality of of intervention at each point of the intervention cycle. And the purpose of this is to create a step-by-step -step design that supports children so that they are engaged, they're, they are doing something that's attainable, but also they are just challenged enough to feel their effort. And so when children feel the results of persistence and their internal motivation, it enhances their sense of accomplishment. This brings us to the fourth point of the cycle of excellence, which is mastery. And HFS has a very progressive practice system that we talked about just now. And so we help them get to a place of mastery, positive and optimistic attitude. And so children really feel this sense of achievement and it increases their self-confidence, which then leads to increase of self-validation. They attain mastery in say the exercises, um, the skill-based training that they are um, doing, it also starts to affect aspects of their life in language, social um, skills and emotional regulation, relationships with teachers, peers and family. And so they're also getting an external validation and it develops healing, a sense of belonging and it strengthens their connection with self and others. And this is why it's a cycle, because it brings us back to deepening connection, but now it's stronger. When we talk about connection in the HFS, again, I mentioned the HFS coach. They undergo APA accredited, accredited training. Um, we're very happy to have received a five-year um, accreditation from the APA. And they undergo a training that helps them not only learn um, exactly what this population of children really require, but again, the particular community that we're serving that I talked about, um, and also how to apply practice, acceptance and connection um, in the process of delivering the intervention. And so they are really, really key to helping children build confidence and self-esteem. And we see children with regulated emotions and calmer nervous systems. The second core principle in HFS is that we really leverage neuroplasticity. So not only when we target children, we know that their brains are more plastic than in adult, uh, adult life, but the neurobiological levels of, et of ASD etiology that I talked about or a neurodivergence etiology that I talked about just now are applied here because we want to target cortical change to induce bottom of behavioral change. And so when we talk about music listening therapy to target auditory processing, skill-based exercise training to target many different um, interrelated areas, not just the motor system, these are... Uh, targeting the neurophysiological level and the physical level. And so on the left, we see cortical systems that our system is designed 
to induce change in and to stimulate and activate. And on the right side is the behavioral phenotypes that we then start to see changes in. So one of the ways that we induce neuroplastic change is through music listening therapy. Um, this is very popular in, uh, as an auditory processing intervention. Um, a quick search would show you lots of studies via music listening therapy. What is happening is that we have frequency band filtration of music at different time points. And so the selective frequency filtration targets the tonotopic map in the auditory system, um, in the lateral superior temporal gyrus, and these are also affecting projections to language processing regions. On top of that, we're using bone conduction um, headphones. So we have direct vestibular stimulation for balance improvement as well and opening the outer ear canal. The other way that we're inducing neuroplastic change is through skill-based exercises. So we have uh, a database of over a thousand individual exercises and activities. They're divided into nine skill categories. And you can see here, breathing, balance, core strength, hand-eye coordination, crossing the midline, body coordination, dexterity, flexibility, aerobic endurance. All of these um, actually activate, of course, overlapping, but also slightly different cortical systems. Um, so for example, we talked about hemispheric asymmetry. Sometimes that comes from a developmental phase where interhemispheric communication is, is atypical. And so when we do exercises like crossing the midline, you are retraining almost in that developmental stage. And so depending on the needs of each child, obviously, we are targeting their um, skill needs. Why do we also use skill-based exercises? So kinesthetic learning means learning by doing. When we talk about um, neurodivergent populations, training just by talking doesn't work, but we know that training by doing becomes much more effective. At the same time, it is activating their motor system as well as their interoception system. Um, it also contains elements of sensory integration, training body awareness. And when we talk about especially aerobic endurance, we increase uh, dopamine regulation in the frontal striatal circuitry. We know that this is extremely, extremely effective, especially for attention, um, for attention training, um, as well as neurotrophic factors for upregulation. So we're increasing the propensity for plastic change in the brain. To give you a training session summary, each HFS session is around one hour. Sometimes it uh, stretches to 90 minutes and it contains music listening therapy for one or one hour to one and a half hours. Simultaneously, children um, are being led by the HFS coach to do a skill-based exercise training. So there are six different exercises per hour. And we have um, a debrief in the last 10 minutes of flow activity. The flow activity is really like a free flowing, almost like a dynamic mindfulness activity. And this is for them to integrate um, and be able to voice what they want to do. So sometimes children do um, drawing, sometimes they choose Play-Doh, sometimes they want to sing, sometimes um, they you know, want to chat even. But it's a chance for children who come into our centers who are already being told at every moment of every day what they have to do. And we really want to give them a period of time to just have um, ownership um, over their, what they want to do. And so this is the, the main structure of the one hour session. In terms of the AI handling, our initial inputs um, come from something we call the fundamental ability survey. Um, or the FAS scores. It is derived from the 5 to 15 parent rating score. It has 13 subscales of different cognitive and behavioral skills with 148 total questions. The scoring ranges from 0 to 2, with 2 being um, the skills are uh, more poorly rated. And 
scoring is based on the normative data that's age and sex stratified. And when we um, have these inputs, our system helps us to optimize two things in the beginning of the um, entire intervention design, which is the music module optimization. So we have six different music listening therapy modules, each have different frequency filtering profiles. Um, and so this is what the AI handling, one of them tries to optimize for us or does optimize for us. The second is the skill-based exercise category weighting. So I mentioned we have nine categories. Um, AI helps us with the category weighting. So the proportion of which skill needs to be focused on more. And it helps us with the starting baseline difficulty. And then we have per session inputs um, as the intervention goes on. So the AI handling for input is the HFS coach feedback. Again, we never leave any of the decisions just only to the technology, only to an AI system. We're consistently feeding in human observation as well. Um, HFS, the coach feedback scores are based on per skill-based exercise scored on multiple dimensions from engagement to physical ability. So combining that with parent feedback scores, um, that is the per session input. And then per session output, the AI optimization is on the skill-based exercise. So again, adjusting for engagement, suitability, attainability. Um, this is what the ch child sees, the children see. So they see a breakdown of um, what are the different top three uh, skills that they they want to build. And here we see the category weighting. So this is the interface that we um, show our clients and their parents um, using our management system. So to end, I want to give you um, a sneak peek of our pilot intervention data that's derived from our California sensors. Um, we took a sample of 58 uh, clients, 58 children with mixed diagnoses. So this is a breakdown of the different diagnoses that we see and uh, male-female distribution. 58 total number of US clients for this sample, uh, trained total of 1,895 hours and a mean age of 9.3 years old. And you can see that um, some of our children and their parents they are really, really committed. They commit to over a hundred hours before um, even beginning the, the therapy, the intervention. And again, I wanna emphasize that our attrition rate is, has been zero so far. This is a pre-post intervention um, comparison of the FAS parent rating scores. And we see that in every single dimension, there is a decrease trend. And in over half of the dimensions, we have a significant difference, um, significant improvement. And this is after an average of 40 HFS sessions. So we see behavioral skills and um, cognitive skills and emotion, attention, impulsivity, concept of time, planning and organization, language and comprehension, expression. You see these improvements. We also tested the before and after intervention effects using something called the VCAT, which stands for the Virtual Classroom Attention Test. This is um, another solution that Cognitive Leap uses, and it's actually an FDA grade diagnostic aid for ADHD and related um, assessments. So um, this is very well published, but I'm not going to go into too much detail on this product because I want to use it um, as uh, an example of how we're objectively objectively tracking attention uh, data in terms of cognitive attention and motor attentions. And so it has a CPT performance test in a 13-minute VR assessment. We have environmental distractors and uh, the user sits in a VR environment and does a task um, in, in a virtual classroom. And so we're tracking their motion data in 3D space throughout this assessment. It's very sensitive to subconscious attention-related performance in real time, and it doesn't rely on subjective third-party observation. And so what we see 
is that in every single VCAT um, variable, we see improvements after an average of 50 HFS sessions. In terms of attention errors, we see significant, highly significant decreases. In terms of um, focus and accuracy, we see highly significant increases. And when we look at the motor, uh, motor measures of attention, so physical impulsivity and physical stillness, we also see significant improvements in all of the variables. So these are extremely, extremely hopeful and very positive results that we're very proud of. It really helps us reinforce that the human-centered design of our intervention is highly effective. We also see uh, correlations in the different scores. So between the different scores of the FAS, so what this is showing is it points back to the interrelated cortical networks that we see are, that are divergent in um, autism because um, the improvements of certain skills correlate with improvements of other skills. We also see correlations between the subjective and the objective measures. Before I pass the, um, the stage to my colleague, Ching, who will share a little bit about um, her experience with the children um, using the HFS intervention and some testimonials, I wanted to leave everyone with some um, nuggets that we've learned really in the last 10 plus years in mental health technology. What we've seen um, and want to avoid is an overemphasis on tech, um, overemphasis over human connection. And what we try to do is put the child with a human coach, not child with technology directly. We also focus on human-centered design. And what does that mean? It means that we really pour a lot of resources into community engagement. We really learn about the ecosystem of the neurodivergent child. And so our aim is to increase so-called ecological validity of our solution. We also avoid a one-size-fits-all approach and we leverage AI to apply flexibility. There also was used to be, you know, this, this uh, attitude in mental health technology or in technology to break all rules. And we found that that really, really doesn't work. Rules are there also sometimes for, for a reason. And this is why that we strive to be accredited by the APA and we never leave decisions fully up to an AI black box. And so lastly, we know that technology can uh, create an access and equity privilege and balance. And this is why we strive to keep it accessible and affordable and available. So thank you. Um, thank you, Crystal. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Qin Bai. I'm the <laughs> human interface, the end user of the HFS system. Uh, so I'm so uh, honored to be here to share um, my experience using HFS system. Um, uh, I'm also the uh, general manager of our Northern California service in Cog Coglip, uh Center for Achievements. Um, yeah, I before that, uh, a little bit about myself. I uh, I graduated from medical school in China, and then I got a uh, molecular genetics uh, master degree, uh, and then I work uh, for a biotech company here in the Bay Area for uh, about seven years, um, and then I I entered a nonprofit world of uh, being volunteer for many years. I think maybe fourteen years till now. Uh, I don't know why they invite me to to help with the, uh, you know the Northern California service, uh, but at that time I was um, uh, I, I want to test it myself first because I I want to make sure it works, uh, and uh, since I I have a, a good connection with people in the Bay Area, I don't want to do something. 
I, I don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, promoted. Uh, so that's when I start. And then I start with a, um, with a kid diagnosed with ADHD and high functional ASD. And the kid um, um, has a, um, you know, uh, emotion regulation problem. It's always, um, you know, very angry at home, uh, refuse to go to any um, clinical, to see any therapist or to go to um, any um, school. And he, um, his parents just want, if, if the son can, you know, uh, do the training with me, that's their only goal. The, it turns out we finished 40 session with the with the boy and then I can definitely see the uh, the emotion regulation and the attention and also communication like social skill improvements um, and we build a very strong connection um, even later on after 40 sessions the kid um, uh, got injury and cannot do exercise with me for uh, almost two, three months. He's still waiting to come back. And the other day, uh, his mom called me saying, oh, he wants to see you again. He wants to do exercise with you again. So that's very, um, I feel very grateful to the HFS system. Uh, so basically, you can put into the children's information there, and it generates the training plan for you. So you don't have to uh, generate by yourself. And then after each session, you put into feedback, and then the system help you uh, fine tune the training plan. Um, and then it's very instructional. So it keep, you know, uh, letting me think about, you know, the, the kid's strengths, uh, how can I encourage him to do more? So by now I've, I've been training four kids, uh, three of them diagnosed with ASD, one diagnosed with ADHD. I can see improvements in all of, in all of them. And, um, I still remember this kid uh, I trained in uh, FCSN, Friendship of a uh, Friend of Children with Special Needs. Um, we have a collaboration with them. And then the kids, um, at the beginning, the father telling me um, um, his son wants to communicate to people, but he uh, doesn't know how to. He keeps saying hi, waving hi, and so happily. And then, and then nothing happened next. He doesn't know what to say next. And then after I trained him, twenty some sessions. One day, he's like um, uh, doing exercise with me, and then he's saying, "Do you know I got a new haircut?" I said, "Yeah, I didn't know." And then he. He put his hair and it's not too long, it's not too short, it's a beautiful haircut. I was like almost um, burst into tears. I, I, I'm really proud of him. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I um, I enjoy the experience. Sorry, I, I, I've been sick since yesterday, had a fever, so I'm a little uh, here and there. Um, yeah, this is just my testimonial. Mm, I can give it back to Crystal to take some questions. Or Lawrence. Yeah, there are some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, can this uh, system be applied to adults? So we have um, piloted the system with different um, individuals above age 18. And I would urge you to try it as well. We, we, do have, we do have individuals 
above 18 years. And uh, the format is the same with uh, the musical therapy and... Uh, the format is the same, but it depends on the baseline scoring. Mm -hmm. So probably they would score higher um, in some of the cognitive functioning because of coping strategies that they've had over the years. And so that would determine where they start. Awesome. Then Vicky has a question. Is it fair to say that one of the core competencies in your model is reduction of fear? Feeling safe is a prerequisite of receptive learning since neuroception and vigilance are at such a heightened rate at baseline in neurodivergent individuals affecting interoception and proprioceptive systems too? Is that why you use sensory modulation to reduce baseline anxiety to maybe anchor a person. Yes, that's you're saying all the right keywords, all the right keywords. So um, your question actually is reflecting your understanding already, first of all, that there are so many levels of um, emotional and nervous system regulation that we are trying to target. And I feel like your question is also reflecting that you understand um, receptive learning really comes from nervous system regulation. And for the layperson, we will see as fear reduction on the surface, but what is going on underneath the surface is sensory modulation to reduce baseline anxiety. We see that um, in the 58 uh, population sample that some of them says other diagnoses and anxiety definitely is one of the um, traits that we see, even though they're not, um, you know, diagnosed for, for GAD, they score high on anxiety. So part of the connection, part of the safety feeling is to reduce this vigilance, maybe from trauma, even from their experiences from anxiety so that it helps them become more receptive. And a uh, follow-up question is, this is a phenomenal program. How are you measuring your success? You, you've shown a lot of good stuff, but for you, what, what, what is the bottom line? For me personally, uh, data speaks, but I would say that why we invited Ching to come and talk about the testimonials is because actually behind the scenes, we get a lot of parent feedback, a lot of children feedback as well messages that just show um, their gratitude and, and how much it's changing their lives. Like, like I mentioned in the beginning, some of the kids that come through our, our uh, centers, they have maybe exhausted a lot of solutions and not been able to find improvement. So for me personally, that is, you know, you can see behavioral change, you can see emotional change. Um, Maybe other departments in my company will have other metrics for success that I'm not, I'm not familiar with, more, more uh, you know, financial statistics. Right. Are you using eye tracking or eye gaze metrics in the VCAT? Just asking because there's been so much publicity around eye tracking and perceptual differences in understanding social cues in neurodivergent population. Yes. So eye tracking is a feature, a uh, hardware feature, actually, in many of the new VR headsets. And it is something that is important that we could be tracking with NDDs. We do have an eye tracking um, test module in our development pipeline. I would say that our product building philosophy is extremely practical. So if something is adding to the diagnostic assistance value or something is adding to the intervention value, then we're gonna use it. If something is only marginally adding to the value of the end result that we want to do, which is helping clinicians make clear diagnosis, helping coaches and helping children get the most accurate intervention. If it is marginally only producing those effects, then we're not building technology for the sake of building technology. That is our, our philosophy on that. So in short, yes, we, we do have a test module on that. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering if the, you, you have any uh, objective measures for social interactions, just like VCAT for 
more for attention. In terms of, sorry, can you rephrase your question? I didn't yeah, quite so understand. The WeChat is, right now is basically uh, focusing on uh, attention, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, thinking about the autism population, uh, the mm -hmm. core feature that we mm -hmm. all talk about is uh, the differences in social interactions. Do yes. Yes. So a, a VR. Uh, uh, um, solution for that? I would love to see that come to life. I think that one of the conversations we've had around um, using VR with the uh, neurodivergent population is, is their compliance with um, wearing the VR headset because of um, sensory sensitivity. And so if we can overcome that, then we can, we can do the data tracking. Maybe you have some suggestions on how to how to help them get comfortable wearing yeah. a VR headset. Yeah. Desensitization, uh, desensitization is usually what we do for uh, right. things like that. Uh, like okay. uh, kids that are sensitive to loud noise in the MRI machine, we mm -hmm. use a, a mock scanner for mm -hmm. uh, to get them feel more comfortable before self habituation. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, and uh, Vitaly is asking about uh, where to read about uh, your HFS system. So, uh, yep. Uh, it depends on what aspect of it you want to read about. You can go to our website. So, uh, CogLeap is a subsidiary of Cognitive Leap Solutions. So, our main company is Cognitive Leap Solutions, and CogLeap are our centers is what we call our center. So you can go to um, our websites, any of those websites to read more about the HFS. And since we have pilot data, we are working on a publication, which you can probably read about um, after we publish. And we'll keep you informed. We still have uh, uh, a number of questions, um, but our uh, time is is up. Uh, we, we can go to uh, we can uh, basically have one more question, and then after that, uh, we'll have to end this session. Um, so ju just want to say th thank you, Dr. Go and Dr. Bai, for uh, sharing your phenomenal uh, intervention. Um, and we, we really love to know uh, more about future results. But this uh, yeah. question is from Dr. Kai, uh, Ruyen Kai said, thanks for the interesting presentation. Uh, well, first question is, is the intervention available in other locations outside of the United States due to the reliance on the coach, number one? And then number two is, oh, maybe you answer that question quickly and then I'll move on to the second. Yes, so we have a very, very big presence in Asia, actually. Um, today's talk really focused on the US population Population, but we have been um, experimenting, building, developing, um, and using HFS in collaboration with rehabilitation centers as well as hospitals across China as well. Um, we also have different modalities. So we do have online. We do have one-on-one, -on -one, one on many. We are collaborating with different schools. We also have a presence in um, Canada. And our... Um, Diagnostic aid solution actually is also much more widespread. We also have presence in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think you you answered the, the rest of the questions um, for from Dr. Kai. So uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we have just one hour for uh, to to speak with you. Uh, we hope that we can learn more. Um, from your, your group in the future. Yes, thank you again, uh, Dr. Fung, for inviting us. We're very excited to be part of this conversation and looking forward to more collaborations. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Recording stopped.